and I am with the Aquaculture Genetics and Breeding Technology Center at VIMS, and I run one of our two hatcheries that we have um, focusing on polyploid oyster breeding. So today we'll go a little bit of some background on the Eastern Oyster. Um, Crossoxia virginica is our native oyster to the bay, but it's found all from Canada down to Central America, and people love to eat it, so it has a huge economic importance, but it's also really important ecologically as well. Um, oysters are a keystone species and an ecosystem engineer, so these big reefs that you see in the water um, that are typical of oysters um, are really important to, to serve as both a habitat and a structural reef for other animals in the area too. And you've probably heard before that oysters are really important for being filter feeders. Um, there's a well-known statistic that um, back in colonial times that the oysters could filter the bay, completely clean the water in the estuary in about three to four days. Unfortunately, the population of oysters in the Chesapeake Bay has declined. Um, and now that statistic is more that it takes about a year to completely filter the water in the bay. Um, but like I said, they were really prevalent at one time. And at the time of Captain John Smith's explorations in the area, he remarked in his journals that the oyster reefs were so high that they broke the surface of the water and posed a navigational hazard. Uh, we don't see that anymore. And unfortunately, there has been a big decline in the oyster population in the bay, as I mentioned. And part of that is through anthropogenic activity. So oysters are really popular to eat. So there's a lot of fishing pressure. And earlier on, there wasn't a lot of regulations on that. And then unfortunately, also, we've had um, two diseases that showed up in the Chesapeake Bay. So we had MSX that happened in the 1950s. And this was kind of introduced accidentally. Um, when we were bringing in um, by experimental transfer of the Pacific oyster. And this parasite is more prevalent in saltier water and can persist for years and tends to be more prevalent in warmer months. And then we also had Dermo, which came out in the 1980s. And again, this one is also another one that's more prevalent in higher salinities and in warmer months as well. Um, it's transmitted oyster to oyster and it's kind of density dependent. And what I mean by that is you have um, oysters in the wild generally kind of make those big reefs and aggregate together. So the fact that the oysters are really close together allows transmission to happen pretty easily. Um, so when these two diseases came about and came into the area, they were enacting on already weakened populations. And because of that, they basically decimated the oyster industry in Virginia. And that has kind of where ABC comes into play. So in 1997, the Virginia General Assembly um, established the Aquaculture Genetics and Breeding Technology Center, or ABC for short, and kind of tasked us with finding out a way to address this problem of the decline caused by these MSX and dermo outbreaks, but also to address the parallel decline of the natural fishery. So what we were supposed to do is use a combination of selective breeding and genetics research to try to find a way to basically domesticate the eastern oyster for aquaculture and to improve on its traits. So the primary focus of doing this was to try to address the problems of dermo and MSX and um, improving on the production traits later on. So how do you do that? Um, and it's all through breeding. So here's a little bit of a genetics lesson for the day. Selective breeding, which is our main focus, is taking the idea that there is an external characteristic that an organism displays, which is called your phenotype. And the idea is that this external characteristic is going to be reflected internally in your genes and therefore can be passed on to the offspring. So by taking an organism that displays a specific phenotype, you're going to be able to have it reflected in a genotype and pass it on to his offspring. So this little image here I found a few years ago when the Pokemon Go game was really popular, uh, but I still like to use it because it does a good job of explaining um, selective breeding. But the idea is that in this case, this Pokemon trainer doesn't want to breed his Pokemon to be really good at battle. Instead, he wants to breed them to be cute and adorable. 
And that happens all the time with dog breeds, actually. Um, all dogs are the same species, but through selective breeding, we've got all these different kinds of breeds. And even within breeds, you'll have things like different um, statures that they breed for. So the idea for like this poodle, if you wanted to breed a smaller poodle, you'll take small ones that exhibit that external trait of being really small, breed them with other small ones, and then through over gen throughout generations, that'll keep getting passed on. And that's how you get these teacup versions. So that's like basically what selective breeding is. And it's not anything new. It actually happens all the time with agricultural products like wheat and various fruits. Um, in fact, one of the really common ones is that kale, cabbage, um, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and there's a few more. All of those together, actually, they're all the same plant, but they've all been selectively bred to pick certain external traits. And so that's how you get the diff different vegetables. So how is this going to work in relation to breeding for disease resistance? And it's pretty simple. It actually just comes down to survival. Um, if you're dead, you're not resistant to the disease. Um, but if you are, ha if you happen to survive, if you had that external characteristic or phenotype of being alive, then maybe there's something in your genes that could be passed on to your offspring that'll allow them to survive as well. So what people at VIMS did at this point in time was they would go out into the wild, into the areas where this disease was prevalent, and pick up a bunch of survivors and start breeding them together and hope that this would get passed on and that all the offspring would be able to survive as well. And it worked. So over a few generations, they were able to alter the and tell from you on the right that in comparing it to the wild populations, you ended up getting with much higher survival when they were selectively breeding these oysters in comparison to oysters that were just taken from the wild. Okay, so with the creation of these new resistant lines, aquaculture started to really take off a few years later. And now ABC continues to help revitalize the industry by continuing to breed these um, lines that are gonna be resistant, but also looking for different traits as well that might be of commercial importance. Okay, so where this all happens is that we have two hatcheries here. Um, one at the main campus on Gloucester Point, and the other one is about 30 miles north, the Kauffman Aquaculture Center, which is the one that I am running. Um, but the, Kauff the Gloucester Point Hatchery is our main facility, and it's been home to all of ABC's breeding work since 1998. And the thing that sets the ABC Hatchery apart is that we be able to do a large number of genetically distinct spawns each year. They're continually updating the space to try to make it um, really optimize our role in oyster genetics and breeding and reflect current industry practices. So. The hatchery at Gloucester Point now houses all of the diploid breeding work and research, as well as our outdoor nursery system and a variety of experimental systems as well. We work a lot in conjunction with commercial hatcheries and other research groups, so there's a lot of work that they do at Gloucester Point to um, focus on developing new things. And so inside the hatchery there itself, there's tanks, tanks, and more tanks. And the whole reason for tanks is that each tank that you see here can hold a genetically distinct cross. So the more tanks you have, the more you're able to detect to test genetic variants. So like I mentioned, what sets them apart is the large number of genetically distinct spawns that they're able to produce each year, which requires a large amount of record keeping and diligence by staff there to be able to um, really separate and maintain all of these different cultures. So my facility is the Kaufman Aquaculture Center, or CAC for short, and we're located on Lockleys Creek, which is a tributary of Rappahannock River and located about 30 miles north of Gloucester Point. Um, the building was erected in 2004 and came into operation really in 2005 and significantly expanded our scope of aquaculture research at VIMS at the time. The building was originally designed to hold native and non-native species in a quarantine facility. So at this point in time, there was a 
idea to potentially introduce the Asian oyster, oyster Crassostria area Kansas into the Chesapeake Bay because the native oyster was not doing very well. So in order to do that, you don't want to just bring in a new species and let it loose because you don't know how it's going to interact with the native ecosystem and if it's going to have any detrimental effects. So by designing this facility to hold the native and non-native species in a quarantine facility, we were able to test and do the research on them without putting the Chesapeake Bay native resources at risk. So that was the whole point of the Kauffman Center originally. But in 2009, um, the non-native oyster research ended with a federal decision to not allow the introduction of Asian oysters. And so we refocused our efforts then at that point to um, focus on research for the Chesapeake Bay's native species, Crassostia virginica. So today, the Kauffman Center is home to ABC's polyploid breeding program and all of our research, as well as a primary broodstock holding facility for both um, us and the Gloucester Point facility. So inside the Kauffman Center, it's very similar to the Gloucester Point facility or any bivalve hatchery that you would go to. We have nine tanks like this that are temperature controlled that will hold all of our brood stock. And we have 45 different larval tanks as, and then algal culture, as well as workbenches, microscopes, things like that to all help us to spawn and rear all of our larvae throughout. So the thing to really kind of get about the two um, different hatcheries and our program in general is that this diploid program that we made has been allowed around a lot longer than our tetraploid program. It's really well established and the biggest one around. Um, the tetraploid program though is still kind of in its infancy and has really only been implemented in recent years, but we've had a lot of success with it and we're really happy with how it's going. And the reason that the tetraploids are so important is that they are integral component in the creation of the triploid oyster, which has become the commercially important product. But more on that a bit later. Right now, we're gonna talk about how to actually make the oysters, which is the fun part. So this is a life cycle of the oyster. And this is basically what happens in the wild and in the hatchery, though there are some slight differences. The thing to know about oysters is they are broadcast spawners. So that means they're gonna release sperm and egg like this into the water column where they'll mix with sperm and egg gametes from other oysters nearby. That'll result in a fertilized egg, which after about 24 hours becomes a villager larvae. Um, this larvae actually will live in the water column, swimming around and eating phytoplankton for about two weeks. At that point, they metamorphose and sink down to the bottom where they will become a sessile, non-moving oyster, more like what you're used to seeing. So what we do in our hatchery is primarily this entire thing from spawning to spat stage. And then we have a field grow out site where we keep our adults and maintain everything. So we're doing this entire process in-house in ABC. So before we actually even get to spawning though, there's a lot of prep work to do. Um, we have to determine breeding values for the traits that we want to breed for um, in the off season. And then we use that to create a spawning plan to determine which groups are gonna be crossed together. And this is gonna require a lot of labeling. We like to use different colors. Um, there's a lot of tape, as you can see on the left here. And each of these cups that we're using is labeled for an individual oyster that will stay with that oyster throughout the entire spawning process. Um, we tape out our spawning matrix onto a table so we can visualize which thing, which oysters are gonna be crossed with each other. It's pretty complex. And um, though I'm the only main, the only full-time employee at the Kauffman Center, anytime we do spawn, we have to bring in additional help from our main campus. Uh, from the Gloucester Point facility because it's a very intensive and needs a lot of hands on. So spawning itself, oysters are protandric hermaphrodites. And that means that they generally start off as male, but switch to female later on in their life. There's no way to tell though, just by looking at an oyster, if it's male or female, you have to examine it actually under a microscope. So we'll take a small sample of their gonad, which is kind of this tan colored portion right here, and put it on a slide and look at it under a microscope to determine if it has um, sperm or eggs in it. And they're actually pretty simple to determine. As you can see, the eggs look more like eggs. The sperm are still very hard to actually see individually, but they will move around and kind of vibrate. So once we've determined their, um, the sex, we begin what's called strip spawning. 
So this is the process of actually scraping the, the gonad from the oyster into a beaker and filling it with salt water. So the reason we're doing that is because we're doing genetics research and we're doing um, selective breeding. So we want to be able to know exactly the genetic contribution that each individual has. So that's why we're doing each individual into a cup and having them all labeled separately and stripping their gametes in. From there, we'll take a small subsample of our eggs and put it onto a slide and then count how many eggs are in each of these little drops. So you take Three, three small drops of water with the eggs in it, count how many are in that, take the average, and then you can extrapolate from that based on the volume in your sample and the volume of, how, of the beaker and figure out how many eggs are in um, each beaker from each female. So the reason we do this is again, because we wanna know the exact contribution that each female is going to have to our spawn. And the number of eggs can vary really wildly between each individual female from tens of thousands to tens of millions. And it just depends on the health of the individual female, the time of year, the age, there's a lot of different factors that will go into that. So depending on which type of spawn we are doing will depend on what happens with our females at this point. So we do two different kinds of spawns. We have line spawns and spawns. Lines are um, what we actually distribute to the industry, and those are what have ultimately been selected for certain traits. So lines are done with a large number of parents, so anywhere from 80 to 100 individuals, and the result is this big pool of eggs and sperm that gives you a high numbers and a high, lot of, high amount of genetic variability. Um, the good thing about that also is that if one of these individuals fails, if one male is somehow not able to fertilize any eggs, you still have a lot of numbers in that tank to work with. Families, on the other hand, is where we really examine our specific traits and the heritability of them. So a family is a one-to-one -one cross, so one male by one female. Um, this it basically lets you look at individual traits and how they're, which ones are heritable versus not. And we use our families basically to help make our selected lines. So you'll see what's being able to be inherited and use that to develop the lines. And it helps you to um, track performance over time and generations as well. So in this case, what we're gonna be making is a line. So we've pulled together a whole bunch of females and then split them up individually by the same number of males that we have. Now the males are stripped the same way as the females are and rinsed into a small little beaker and then examined under a microscope to check for sperm motility and make sure there's enough um, sperm actually present there to be able to fertilize eggs. And as you can see here, then they each could just get matched up with um, a female egg cup. And then the crosses will actually happen. So a small amount of sperm is added to each egg cup based on the motility ranking that we have. And you can see here our director, Stan Allen, is continuously referencing the spawning matrix in his hand just to make sure all of our crosses and all of our matches are happening the way that we had intended them to. So after allowing some time for the eggs to be fertilized and the embryos to start dividing, we'll put all of the embryos into individual tanks with clean salt water, algae, and aeration and allow them to develop for two days before we start to look at them. So at the Kauffman Center, we have 45 different tanks, which means we can have 45 unique family crosses or otherwise genetically distinct um, crosses in individual tanks. So each one of these tanks is going to be completely different genetically than the one next to it. Each tank is going to hold millions of larvae to start, though we purposefully reduce the number of oysters in there as they grow so they don't outcompete each other. The water that you see here is going to be pulled from Lockley's Creek directly behind our building, but it goes through filtration to remove um, any algae or anything else in it. And you probably weren't able to see anything in there, but as you can see by looking at this sieve here, there is actually larvae present. So we do a process called drops every other day where we will completely drain our tanks and then catch all of the larvae that are inside on a series of graduated sieves. 
We then rinse all of the larvae into a beaker and look at them under a microscope to assess their survival, their motility, their general health, and how much they've grown. Um, the thing to notice here is like we said, you couldn't tell in the tank just by looking at the naked eye, but you can see it on this sieve. All of this pinkish brown color that you see here is about a million two day old larvae. So this is one of my favorite things to show to people um, when we're doing these kind of talks. And I apologize that these videos are a little jerky. I seem to have a bad internet connection today. But this is two day old oyster larvae. And we refer to these as D stage larvae because they actually kind of look like the capital letter D as you can see here. And something that a lot of people don't know is at this point too, the oysters already have their shells even. So they shell grows with them from day one and just gets thicker and larger as the oysters grow. Now around day five, they start to round out and become more of a circular shape like you can see here. And you'll also be able to see in these as well that there is a distinct gut that you can see present and have that that is filled with the algae that we're feeding our oysters. So speaking of algae, when oysters are out in the wild, they are kind of at the mercy of whatever is present in the water column. So they are, whatever is present for them to eat for their algae, which is our microscopic plants, our phytoplankton, is what they have to eat. And so sometimes there might not be enough. Um, it's going to depend on the season. And there's also some algae that are um, considered harmful as well. We're going to filter all of our water to remove all of our algae and anything negative that could affect the oysters to try to just kind of control our environment as much as possible. So as a result, we have to feed our oysters algae in order to help them grow as well. So we have four different species that we grow at the Kauffman Center and we grow these same four species at Gloucester Point as well. And we grow four different species because they've been tested to do very well in larval culture and grow very well in um, for agriculture as well, and that they each have a different role in um, increasing the health of the oysters. So just like you could survive eating hamburgers for the rest of your life, you would do better off if you threw in some vegetables as well too. The each different algae that we feed them has a different role so they can have a varied diet. So for example, this tetrasalmus, this greener one here, it's larger than any of the other species we feed them. So as a result, they don't actually get that species of algae until they're um, old enough to be able to ingest it as well. But it's really rich in lipids, which happens to be important um, for when the larvae are going to metamorphose and change into um, that spat that's going to um, attach at the bottom. So this is just a quick time lapse video of six oysters over a two hour period to show you how quickly adult oysters can filter algae out of a system. These two 10 liter tanks have the same volume of that tetracelmus algae in it. But as you can see, the oysters on the left are really quite effective at filtering the algae out. So when we feed our larvae, we're feeding very specific densities of algae based on their size and the age of the oysters but the oysters are still generally able to completely clear the tank overnight of algae. And so each day we will feed them more algae and also increase the density of the algae that they're getting each day too. So as our oyster larvae continue to grow, they're gonna take on more of a clam-like shape as you can see here by this one. And you also see that really well in this video, um, the oysters moving around and these little hair-like structures, the cilia that they're using to help move in the in the water column. These are little like hair-like structures that they can beat and it'll help get, move them to swim around, stay afloat and um, control their direction in the water column. And then finally, um, around day 14, the oysters are become what we call eyed and they're ready to harvest. So they'll develop an eye spot that you can't quite see here, but also this foot which they use the eye spot and the foot to help them to seek out a suitable substrate to settle down on. So when you see these eye spots and these feet in your larval culture, then you know that um, the oysters are ready to settle down and metamorphose. So when we're talking about metamorphosis, kind of think of a butterfly, you know, you have a caterpillar that creates a cocoon, goes inside and um, hunkers down for a few weeks, completely rearranging, internally and externally and emerging as a butterfly. 
the oyster is doing the exact same thing. Um, they are going to lose all of their cilia, lose the foot once they found a suitable substrate to settle down and metamorphose into that sessile non-moving oyster that you're used to seeing. So we encourage our oysters to set by putting them in what's called a downwelling system. And it's really creatively named because it's encouraging water to water movement going down. So that's why they're called a downweller. There's a water source coming from the top. And so by doing that, the oysters are kind of encouraged to sink down to the bottom too. We line each of these downwellers also with some ground up oyster shell, and that's done for two reasons. Um, one is that um, the oyster shell itself has kind of a chemical cue that attracts the larvae as they get ready to metamorphose. And so that's why you see out in the wild these big aggregations and huge oyster reefs because new recruits are attracted to that um, the old oyster reefs where from that shell. We also do it as ground up oyster shell called colch. So they're these tiny, like single, like a single grain of sand is basically what it looks like. And the reason for that is because we want single set oysters. We want one individual oyster instead of a large clump. So the idea is then when a eyed larvae goes in and attaches to the single grain of ground up oyster shell, as the oyster itself starts to grow, that grain of colch kind of becomes, um, kind of effectively disappears. So after about 24 hours, after an oyster has metamorphosed, you have this, um, you go from what's up here with the foot out to down in the right hand corner, you can see how much it's changed in just over a 24 hour period after the metamorphosis has, has occurred. So the oysters are going to stay in these downweller systems for one to two weeks until they reach a size that's big enough to go out to our nursery. And our nursery goes, um, is referred to an upwelling system, again, because water is coming from the bottom and encouraging movement upward. This just kind of helps to um, keep the oysters moving and um, circulating in there. The nursery thing is important because it's kind of like an intermediate between the hatchery and the field and before they grow out sites. So the nursery, the oysters at this point are being, um, are on raw water directly from the river. So all of their nutrients, all of their algae, all their food is gonna come directly from the river and where they're no longer supplementing anything from us. So anything that's happening in the wild, they're going to be exposed to at this point. So they'll stay in there for about one to two months. And this picture right here is just to show you how really quickly oysters grow in that nursery system. So they go from being about one millimeter on day one to a half an inch after um, a two month period. So once we're done in the nursery, um, the work certainly isn't over. They go into these seed bags and then de get deployed at our field sites and they'll grow out there until we need to bring them in and assess them for survival and other traits. So we have multiple sites that we grow our oysters out on, um, all which have different environmental conditions which influence the traits that we select for. So for example, we have high and low salinity sites so that we can test which of our lines will do better at different salinities. And as I mentioned early on, um, Dermo and MSX also kind of tend to be more prevalent at higher salinities. So the field grow, grow out sites are also going to vary in their disease pressure as well. It's important to have these multiple sites with their different environmental um, conditions so we can see how these affect the expression and the capability of the traits that we are breeding for. So what do we do with all these families and lines that we are breeding for? Well, each fall, we'll go out to the field and bring back in everything that we've made, and then we will measure their survival and different traits such as meat weight, um, shell height, and um, growth. So this basically helps us to establish our breeding values that we're going to use the following year to determine what we should breed together. So the information that we generally collect makes a bell curve like this. So if you imagine that this is survival and this is looking at all of our families that we've bred in a year. Um, majority of the families are gonna have a survival that's kind of right in the middle like this. But there's gonna be some families that have a really good survival and then some families that have a really terrible survival. So if survival is a trait that we wanna breed for, what we're gonna do 
is take the best of the best for ABC. We're going to keep those for ourselves so that we can use those the following year to breed from. The kind of upper middle was what's going to go to the commercial hatcheries. So they still have oysters that they're going to breed from that have really high um, values for the trait that we're selecting for. So these are still getting really good oysters that have high survival. The lower end gets completely discarded and never even gets spawned from. We don't want those. <laughs> so the idea is that if we're keeping the best of the best for ourselves and breeding with those each year, then generally you're gonna get a shift in this bell curve to the right each year as you're continually doing your selective breeding. So whereas you might start out as having a survival only averaging around 30%, as you continually selectively breed, this is gonna to shift to the right and you might end up with a survival of around 70%. When you see that shift of the bell curve to the right, that's how you know that your selective breeding is actually working. So part of this talk is supposed to be about how we revitalize the oyster industry. And you're probably still unsure exactly how that is. And the answer is through triploid oysters. Um, triploid oysters tend to um, kind of be the holy grail for oyster aquaculture because they grow really fast and they have exhibit a lot of the traits that are commercially important. In fact, since we've started making triplet oysters, it's now become so that it's become such an important product that 87% of oyster aquaculture in Virginia, all of the sales ends up being 87% triploid. And so why is that? The idea is, really just comes down to the fact that triploids are really productive. So regardless of where you're growing your oysters, if you have triploid oysters and diploid oysters of the same age, the triploids are just gonna be much more productive and they're gonna have a much higher body weight. There's a lot of other characteristics about triploids that make them superior to diploids. They have a higher meat yield, they have improved survivability, so their mortality is lower. And they also tend to be more disease resistant than their diploid counterparts. Um, one of the biggest draws though, is that they are able to be um, consumed year round and marketed as a year round product. So you may have heard in the past to not consume oysters in the months that have R in, uh, only consume oysters in months that have R in them and to not eat them in the summer months. And this really, part of it has to do with spawning. So oysters, um, that are diploid are going to, their whole point during the summer is to produce gametes that they can spawn and create new oysters. So diploids will actually have about half their body mass is gonna become um, taken up by gonad by sperm or egg. Triploids on the other hand, don't reproduce. So all of the energy that would have been going into making sperm or egg instead goes into increasing their growth. So they'll grow much larger and much faster. Where this ties into um, being able to be marketed year round is that spawning usually occurs during the summer. So for diploid oysters, when they release their sperm or eggs, since that's kind of taking up the majority of their body cavity, they get kind of like these ones on the left-hand side here, which are spawned out. They look kind of watery and there's not much to them. And so they're just not as palatable or appetizing as the triploids on the right. And so that all just comes down to oysters spawning out or not during the summer. <clears throat> so this is the kind of the final genetics lessons for the day. So oysters, just like humans, are diploid, which means we have two sets of chromosomes. We, get e we each get one set of chromosomes from the biological male parent and the one from the biological female parent. And that's going to be the same thing that happens for the oysters. Now, so that's how diploid oysters will be made. The triploids are a little bit different. And so triploids are made using a tetraploid male and a, a diploid female. Same deal, but in this case, you'll end up having two sets of chromosomes that come from the tetraploid male and one set that comes from the diploid female, resulting in a 3N or triploid oyster containing three sets of chromosomes. So you might have remembered from biology classes or have gathered from these pictures that sperm or egg cells contain half the sets of chromosomes as the actual parent itself does. So this is what makes a triploid functionally sterile. So a tetraploid oyster has four sets of chromosomes. Its sperm or egg is gonna have half of that. It's gonna have two. Diploid oysters have two sets of chromosomes. Their sperm or egg are gonna have one set of chromosomes. Triploid oysters, 
triple or three does not divide very easily by two. So they can't really make sperm or eggs. So that's basically how they've um, become functionally sterile. They can't divide that very equally to get um, chromosomes to make sperm or egg. And as a result, like I said, they put all of that energy into growing bigger, faster, and larger. And so the oysters on the top here are triploids and the bottom ones are diploids and they are all the same age. So you can see why this would be um, more appealing to people consuming the oysters. But you're still probably wondering how we make a tetraploid and it's really complicated. <laughs> um, this whole process was developed by our director, Dr. Stan Allen. And as you can see, it looks really difficult um, and it is. Um, the whole thing to take away from this is that it's really complicated to make tetraploid oysters. And it takes about four generations until you can actually have tetraploids that you can breed from. And we are luckily at that point now that we are down here at the bottom. So we've got our tetraploid lines that we can continue to breed from. So we don't have to go through this really complicated multi-generational process anymore. Um, the other thing to take about this is because it's so complicated, most hatcheries don't do this. And also in the larval culture, it's really hard to maintain tetraploid oysters as well. They don't do as well as diploids. So because of that, um, most hatcheries don't do their own tetraploids. It's far easier to get selectively bred oysters from us to use as their brood stock for making triploids. Um, but just like with the diploid breeding program, ABC actually has the most extensive tetraploid family breeding program around too. So just a couple final things to kind of tie this all together and show how ABC is related to commercial hatcheries and even the restaurants that you get oysters from. Um, first off, we make those diploid and tetraploid brood stock, and they all have been field tested and selected for certain traits. So when a hatchery contacts us, they can request something based specifically on what traits they need, if they need something that's going to do well at a low salinity or if they have high disease pressure in that area. If they're unsure also, they can ask our field manager for recommendations that he has based on what's doing really well in the field that year or based on their characteristics of their site that they're going to have. A commercial hatchery itself is then going to create those triploid larvae and depending on their capabilities and whether or not they have a farm or grow out system, they'll either sell it or um, keep it for themselves. So spawning on a commercial hatchery is the same concept of that as us, but it's just done on a much um, larger scale because they're not doing any kind of genetic testing. They're working on the hundreds of millions of oysters versus where we're working on the scale of like 1 million for our larvae. So they're just doing everything really ramped up and really scaled up. Their spawning process also happens to be a little bit different because they don't have to do um, the selective breeding like we do. So they're not looking to know exactly as um, precise of knowledge of their genetic contribution. So one thing that's really kind of fun about a commercial hatchery is they'll do their spawn a little different than we do. So they have a way of determining males and females without shucking the oysters. And I always think this is fun to share with people too. So imagine off screen from this, you have a big, huge tray of oysters with warm water going over it that's encouraging them to release their gametes. So the hatchery personnel then at this point are watching this big tray to see how they're releasing their eggs or sperm and then dividing them up between these two bins. So you can see in this white bin, occasionally you'll see an oyster will basically open up and then close really rapidly, releasing a cloud of eggs into the water column that you can kind of see down here. Those are the females. The males, on the other hand, up in the blue bin are just kind of ga slightly gaping open and continually releasing a plume of sperm into the water column the whole time. So I just think this is neat that they can actually see that the different sexes have a different way of releasing their gametes into the water column. And that's their way of being able to spawn these oysters without having to sacrifice them like we unfortunately do. So after this, and they've differentiated the males and females, they're able to complete their spawns in a very similar way to what we do. And the whole grow out process of growing larvae is the same as what we do. It's just, again, on a much higher scale, but they're doing drops every other day, checking for survival and checking for growth and things like that. Once they get to this stage where you have that eyed larvae though, this is where it becomes kind of different. Um, they will either sell their eyed larvae just like this, 
for places that have their own downwelling systems, or they will set them themselves and then sell the spat itself. So now commercial farm, what, depending on what product they have purchased, they will either set the oysters themselves or if they have purchased spat, then they will grow these out until market size. So most commercial places will have kind of a nursery system. And again, this is kind of the same setup that we have with these upwelling systems. So you can see this nursery on the left-hand side that's similar to ours. But a lot of places have what's called a flopsy also, which is a floating upweller system. It's the exact same concept where you have water coming in from the bottom and encouraging the mixing of the oysters and they're getting water and algae from the river. But you can see over here on the right, it's really big. This is just really scaled up and um, really on a more commercial size than what we do here. So again, this is being kept in here for one to two months until they re reach their nice single, um, a nice size that they can actually go out into the nursery bags. But again, they're going to be still single oysters like we do. And from there, they're going to go out into the field into a variety of different um, gear to grow their oysters in. So you can have cages that go on the bottom. You can have various floats. Um, there's floating cages and bottom cages, rack and bag like we do, and then even this long line system that you see to the right. The gear that they're gonna use to grow out their oysters is kinda gonna depend on the environmental conditions they have, what type of bottom it is, and any resources they have available. So there's not necessarily a superior gear to use. It's kind of really gonna just depend on the environment you have and what, what, what you have available to you as well too. And then lastly, um, these single set oysters make it to a restaurant or will be sold directly to you as a consumer to prepare at home. So you should know that the shellfish industry is really highly regulated and safe. That whole thing about eating our oysters in our months is gonna no longer apply. And part of that, like we said, is gonna come down to that majority of the oysters being sold are triploid oysters. So they're not gonna be running and spawned out. Uh, but it also has to do with a lot of the regulations and refrigeration and how things are handled now. Um, there's been a lot of improvements in that and it's being really well monitored by the Virginia Department of Health. So you don't have to worry about that. You can eat your oysters. Um, it's really highly regulated. If you go to a restaurant or a seafood supplier, you should ask where the oysters are coming from and any reputable place will be able to tell you because the environment that they're grown is gonna affect their taste. If you like really salty oysters, you're gonna want one that's coming from a higher salinity site or from the seaside. Um, so if you tell your server what you're looking for, they're gonna be able to recommend something that is going to suit your palate. Um, so lastly, um, just a little bit more about what's gonna be continuing to go on at ABC. We are constantly um, improving our work. Uh, we've really developed that tetraploid breeding program in the past couple of years and are really focusing on breeding for tetraploid families now. Um, and we're looking at the heritability of tetraploid traits and how that translates over to the triploids as well too. One of the things we really do is we have a really great relationship with a lot of commercial hatcheries and farms. So whenever they have issues, they can contact us and we try to help them out as much as possible because we need them to succeed for us to succeed as well too. We have a program called OAT, which unfortunately we're not doing right now because of COVID. Excuse me, but OAT stands for Oyster Aquaculture Training. And the idea is that every year during our spawning season, we tend to bring in a couple people that are recent graduates that are looking at getting involved in oyster aquaculture in a commercial sense. And so we'll have them hang out with us for a whole summer and learn everything that we do from growing algae to spawning and larval rearing and then all of the field work as well too from the grow out on the farms. And this allows them to not only get really practical hands-on experience, but also allows them to figure out areas that they really like and excel at so that they can go into their um, looking for commercial jobs that are more related to that. We also like to do a lot of outreach through tours and school visits and science projects helping out with that. Uh, if anybody, um, we're kind of limited on, restricted on that right now with COVID, but if you're interested in um, trying to figure out about a tour for either the Kaufman Center or the Gloucester Point facility, um, feel free to send me an email and we can chat about that and see what's 
allowed to happen. We also do a Marine Science Day, which happens every year in May. And last year we did it virtually, and I don't know if they've made a decision about that for this year either. But stay tuned to our website um, in the next coming months, and hopefully you can come in and visit us at Marine Science Day. The Gloucester Point facility is really fun to go take a tour of, and it's one of the most popular attractions for Marine Science Day. But Marine Science Day is really great because you can see everything at VIMS and all the other different groups as well, too. Um, lastly, I just invite you to check out our ABC website here, um, and I can maybe post this in the chat later too, um, just to keep updated on what's going on with us and learn more about everybody who works there. And um, like I said, if you want any questions, feel free to email me, and at this point I'm happy to answer any questions as well too. So thank you guys very much for tuning in.